Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wheeler Centre and Texts in the City, the series where we take uh, books, films, plays from the BC English syllabus and dissect them up here on stage and hopefully give a, a few different perspectives on the text that we're looking at. Uh, my name's Andrew MacDonald, and today we have uh, Australian director Bruce Beresford's uh, film from 1997, Paradise Road, to look at. Uh, and here to talk about Paradise Road uh, and bring his filmic knowledge to the session is Thomas Coldwell. Uh, Thomas is a film critic. He does the weekly film review on Triple R's Breakfasters. He also co-presents the Triple R film criticism podcast called Plato's Cave. He works for MIF, the uh, International Film Festival, coming up very soon in Melbourne. Uh, and you can read his blog, cinemaautopsy.com. Please welcome Thomas. Hmm. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> So this film, World War II, Female Prisoners of War, Bruce yeah. Beresford, the famous Australian film director. Uh, first impressions when you first watched it, what, what did you take away from it? Um, how frustrated I am with Bruce Beresford as a director. He makes some re he look, he's made some of Australia's great films. And, you know, Breaking Morant is one of the all-time great war films, let alone Australian films. And he also has a tendency to make some very middle-of-the-road films, which I find a little bit bland, that touch on interesting themes and ideas, but don't really explore them to the kind of rigour and depth that you would hope for. And Paradise Road is kind of in that camp for me. I, I found this a frustrating film. I think there's an enormous amount to talk about it from a critical point of view, and if you're writing on film and within the context of conflict, absolutely. But as a film in its own right, yeah, I didn't dig it. And um, okay, yeah, well, sorry. Hey, Paradise <laughs> Road, everybody. <laughs> um, but as you say, there's a, there's a lot to talk about, and there's a yeah. lot kind of there, and there's a lot perhaps not there in the film as well. Um, it's based on kind of events that took place uh, in during World War II yep. um, on the island of Sumatra. Mm -hmm. um, events that weren't actually kind of included in the film, the film, the events that the film was based on originally. Yeah, no, I mean, and this is something very interesting to look into with this film. Um, it, it's 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 based on a true story. Now. Um it's really tricky, I think, grappling with film that is based on real events to try to, um, to try to figure out where you're going to come at it from. When talking about a film purely for its artistic worth and value, I, I don't necessarily think it's all that important to how true it is when talking simply about how good it is as a work of art. However, film does have a broader context and a broader effect in the community, and it does shape the way people think about the past. So when you've got a film like this which deals with some fairly important issues and quite an important part of Australian history, there is, I think, a degree of responsibility to how well the film represents history, especially if it's claiming to be based on true events. And this film makes some really radical distortions of what actually actually happened. Um, yeah, so the, so the Bankar Island massacre, in which I think about 20 Australian yep. military nurses were kind of gunned down in the ocean, um, not there at all, despite that being perhaps the most horrific thing that kind of is part of that story, including the events that were shown in the film. Yeah, I mean, this is extraordinary. The, the, the big thing that came out of this story was that massacre. These 22, there were 21 Australian nurses and one Australian civilian when they landed on, on the beach. And we see this scene in the film, you know, the, the boat getting attacked and them swimming ashore, and they're on the beach. In real life, they got caught by the Japanese on the shores and marched into the water, and they were machine gunned. And the reason we know about this is one of them, um, one of the women who the Glenn Close character is very loosely based on, survived that. I think the, bull, the bullet just went right through her leg and she sort of fell under the water and lay there. So this fairly heavy incident is excluded in the film. And the, I mean, the other important thing about this incident is this got reported in Australia and, and it has a lot to do with the anti-Japanese sentiment that grew in Australia during um, World War II. I mean, this was sort of the event that really made Australians, I suppose, hate and despise the Japanese. And you know, an entire generation was, was affected by this. And this incredibly important scene isn't in the film. There are a couple of other horrific 
scenes. Uh, one is the torture of Kate Blanchett's yep. character, uh, and the other is the the emulation of Wing. Yeah. Um, and they they are both kind of like almost there in place of that massacre. Yeah. No, the, yeah. This is interesting, and this is what it, it's a weird film in this way that, that sort of pulls its punches in some regard with how it depicts some of the war crimes and human rights abuses. But on the other hand, it goes really nuts with depicting stuff that didn't happen. So, yeah, you're right. It's like they, 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 they didn't want to show the massacre at the start of the film, and I'll come back and touch on why I think they did that and why I disagree. But they, they sort of substitute that with other acts of human rights abuse to try to convey the idea that the Japanese were, were being abusive. And, and there's two, well, maybe three, but the, the, the two obvious ones are the Cape Blanchett torture and, yeah, when they set the Chinese woman on, on fire. Now, this did not happen. Um, and I, to the best of my knowledge, they don't even know whether it happened anywhere. Um, I mean, certainly there were horrible abuses of human rights that went on in the Japanese camps. Um, mainly because the Japanese had a very different attitude as well, though, towards what a prisoner was, which is something that's not developed in this film film either. Um, the, the, other, the other sort of substitute human rights abuse to get in this film is the, um, the firing on the boat. So we have, um, yeah, the, the civilian boat passing through and the Japanese plane opens fire on that. And you get lines later in the film about... That was full of women and children. What about the Geneva Convention? And you know, the Japanese guy makes some comment about, well, we didn't sign that, it's all about winning. Even though apparently the Japanese hadn't signed the G Geneva Convention, but apparently they had released statements to say, in essence, they were in favour of a lot of it. Um, the, the problem I have with the attack on the boat in the film is, and again, this, this is from, look, there's a brilliant article by a guy called Hank Nelson in the Journal of the Australian War Memorial, where he goes through this stuff in detail. And he explains that the boat that got attacked in real life was a legitimate target. And people who got on these boats, for whatever reason, were aware of the dangers. And that boats that were clearly identified as being Red Cross boats or carrying nurses, the Japanese actually didn't attack those. So again, the scene in the film where the boat, where the boat gets attacked is depicted as sort of you know, a breaking a convention or, or you know, breaking the rules of war, where in actual fact, it, it, that was a legitimate target, that boat. And it also, that's the other thing, I mean, <laughs> if they're trying to give you a sense of the Japanese committing this atrocity by, instead of having them shoot the people on the beach, they show them being shot on the ship, it loses an enormous amount of power because it's distanced. Someone in a plane firing on a boat, and you don't even see the Japanese characters in that sequence, really, really removes you, you and the Japanese characters from the horror of what's happening. So, so the attacking the boat is a real pulling of the punches. On the other hand, they show this extraordinary sequence where they set a woman on fire, which is really hysterical and, and full-on and, and disturbing. Let's talk about that a little bit because mm. it's, it's no mistake that that's a Chinese character that yeah. is emulated like that. Um, and I think that you can look at some of the individual characters over the course of the film and um, their nationalities and there's certainly a huge um, mixing pot of different types of kind of backgrounds and cultural backgrounds. Um, and they're all very symbolic and, and the Chinese one is kind of, you know, really, really obvious. Um, mm. But maybe let's take a look at a, a couple of others, mm. such as the, the German doctor, the, the Jewish German doctor, I think is a really interesting character. Yeah, the Frances McDormand character. Yeah. She is interesting. The way she is positioned in the film is possibly having a foot in both camps. You know, the idea that, that she's German and um, she might be getting special privileges in the film. This is something that's... I mean, this is important when talking about the issue of conflict. Obviously, it's not just prisoners and the captors in this film. Conflict is about all the different subgroups within the film and, and certainly um, the Jewish-German doctor, there is a lot of conflict with her and the other characters. At first, you sort of get lines of dialogue saying, we suspect her because, because she's German. But I think very quickly the film sort of passes, passes over that. Um, you know, there is the suggestion that she is sort of consorting with the Japanese to get to get favours, but we, we realise very early, just from her acting, that it's part of an act. You know, she, she makes the comment in the film that, yep, I get cigarettes and whiskey for doing this for the Germans, but I also, uh, for the Japanese, but I also get medicine to look after, to look after you lot. Um, it, this is part of my overall frustration with the film. She's presented as possibly at the start as being a complex character and I think very quickly becomes yet another one of the good guys. Um, 
the most interesting scene is when the Kate Blanchett character finds her chipping away at the teeth for the gold fillings, which is something that the Nazis did do to, um, uh, to you know, people in the concentration camps. And here we have a Jewish doctor doing this to, to, to the dead people in the Japanese camp. That was actually a really powerful interesting scene in the way it depicts how far do you go to survive and what is appropriate under extreme circumstances. And, you know, in the film, she quite overtly says, these characters are dead. This gold, I can trade the Japanese for medicine. Um, that is a moment, I think, that really does sort of, chal- you know, raises some interesting moral and ethical uh, questions. So that's a good scene, in my opinion. Yeah. It's, it, yeah, it really is the scene that that character changes because when yep. Kate Blanchett goes screaming into the room or screams about the, uh, the teeth coming out, she, yeah. Oh, and you, know, of- you know how we know that she's a good character in that scene? Because she then talks about how wonderful Dvorak is. Did uh, I pronounce that yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's throughout the film, anybody connected with music is redeemed. Music is the great redeemer in this film. Yeah. Which, is, you know, that's quite a nice idea. I quite like that theme. We'll come back to music uh, mm. in a little bit. Uh, I do want to talk about the kind of the genre of the war movie, though, because mm. it's one of the, um, the kind of the, the concept behind the movie, the story behind this film is, is really interesting. Um, kind of, you know, the Australian war drama, prisoners of war, uh, what's it like in the camp, except you're taking what is normally a kind of male dominated kind of, you know, lots and lots of male characters and all female characters. What do we, what do we kind of get by the end of the film by kind of having a portrayal of a, a female populated prisoner of war camp? Yeah, I, it is inter- I can't think of too many films like this, sort of mm. female prisoner films, apart from crazy exploitation stuff, which you probably wouldn't get on your reading lists. But um, in, in terms of mainstream cinema, you don't see a lot of female prisoner films. And I think at the time, critics made jokes about it being a female, you know, bridge over the river choir and sort of fairly mm. flippant comments like that. What I like about this film is the women aren't male substitutes. I think often filmmakers make the mistake of making a strong female character by making her identical to a male I think the, 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 these are proper female characters, um, and, and when you get moments, when you get hints of complexity in these characters, the film works works really, really well. Mm. And it, it doesn't shy away from the fact that it's an era where women were subordinate to husbands and fathers. And they show that very well and very clearly at the beginning when we have the civilised world and the women are the subordinates, and then, and then as the movie progresses and things get less and less civilised, the women become proper individual people. Mm-hmm. They come into their own. I mean, that yeah. opening sequence is interesting. Um, I mean, I think it's really didactic. It's sort of fairly laying it on thick, what the themes are and how the different characters are positioned. But the interaction at, at that ball it raffles, you know, just before the Japanese start bombing. Which again, it didn't happen like that. The <laughs> the allies the allies knew the Japanese were coming. The, the, the nurses who had to be evacuated on that night were probably working in hospitals trying to save lives. They weren't at a ball dancing. It's sort of hmm, it's a bit, it's kind of frivolous and I think a little insulting the way the film suggests that all the women involved were just having a party that night. In real life, they were working really hard and they knew what danger they were in. Anyway, back to back to the content, back to the film. Um, yeah, you, you've got the British wives. Um, You've got some of them who are quite complicit with their husband. I mean, the husbands are being morons in that opening scene. They're, they're, they're sort of being... They're being both naive and offensive about the Japanese, saying stuff that... You know, you watch it in today's context and you chuckle about, well, little do they know the Japanese are quite a mighty force and they're about to get their butts kicked. Um, you get hints, though, of some of the, 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 some of the individualism and, and fieriness from some of the women in that sequence, some of the ones, ones who speak up. All the personalities get introduced in that opening scene quite nicely. Um, you know, the Kate Blanchett character, Susan, you've got the, um, you know, the soldier who straight away says, oh, you, you're a shy country type, and she sort of makes some comment about, oh, am I? I wasn't aware of that. And we sort of realise throughout the film that she's a lot more feisty. I mean, she becomes sort of the larrikin character, and again, not in a male way, but she becomes that sort of... She is a female equivalent of the blokey, makes smart-ass comments, stands up to people, is quite defiant, has a kind of really wicked sense of humour, but I don't think she's a male substitute. I think that that's a good character. Um, you, you get a sense of the Glenn Close character being quite intelligent. You get a sense of people like Mrs Tipler, though, 
you know, Pamela Ray. We don't see it to the boat, actually, but very early on in the film, you get an idea about how self-serving she is, um, which is a nice reminder that these, you know, all these people, just because they're under harsh conditions, it doesn't make them heroes automatically. Some people in times like these become extraordinary, extraordinarily selfish to the detriment of others. Um, Rosemary Layton Jones, played by Jennifer Earle, that's a really interesting interaction we get with her at the start of the film with her husband, where she says to him, you're beautiful. And he gets all kind of freaked out and says, what, men can't be beautiful, you can't call me that? And she says, yeah. no, no, but you are. It's, that's a real interesting role reversal. And throughout the film, you know, you, often in these war films, you get the guy pining for his girlfriend or wife. Um, and in this film, it's her. You sort of see a woman who's deeply in love, pining for her husband. And, and he is sort of made to look quite, quite beautiful. And, you know, when she sees him in the forest, it's sort of this moment of hope. And then, you know, when she sees him all beaten up, it's a moment of despair. And sort of this love she has for him is something... This sort of obsessive romantic love is something you often get with, with male characters. So I like the way that was, that was done with her. Yeah, and I guess if you're kind of looking at the way that kind of hope kind of develops in the, in the camp, then her character is a really good one to look at. Yeah, exactly. That, that sort of love keeps her going yeah. on. And she also, she's smart enough not to look at any photos of him. Because in a war film, if you show people photos of your loved ones, you're going to die in the next <laughs> scene. Let's talk about one of the other things that I think is probably um, an additional aspect to a, a female prisoner of war situation that maybe isn't addressed in the film or is probably you know, a slight nod towards it, and that's the kind of the threat of sexual violence, um, especially in a camp that is being run by male Japanese soldiers, um, female prisoners. Um, I guess we have a couple of scenes where... Um, Glenn Close's character is, is, you know, kind of assaulted by the drunk soldier. Yep. And, and also the scene before the, before the snake kind of strangely goes into the office and sings. Before that, we think that maybe he's going in there for mm. other reasons. Um, why isn't there more of that? Mm. Well, I think, they just, I think the kind of film this is and the audience it's pitched to, they didn't want to go there. Like I said, there's a lot of pulling of the blows in this film. A lot of... Yeah, it's weird. They're happy to set a Chinese woman on fire but they really avoid the threat of sexual violence. It's, um, there's some kind of gross double standards there, actually. Um, there is, of course... You don't, you don't think the director was just kind of trying to, you know, be subtle about it? He wanted the audience to think? Well, if you're subtle, you wouldn't have a scene where he said a Chinese woman on fire. Yes. I think, yeah. And, and, you know, the whole Kate Blanchett stuff is really graphic as well. Um, no, I... <sighs> I think that, there was a, that was a decision to keep the film really accessible and broad. I mean, it, it's, it's weird the way we respond to... Sexual violence is a real taboo in, in, in culture and in film. Compared to showing murder and beatings, that, for some bizarre reason, is more acceptable. Um, you do get it presented in the, uh, the, the... What is it? The Satin Sheet Brigade scene, where the women are taken to the, the Japanese officers' club and... And you know, it's also respectable. It's sort of the Japanese saying, we're not going to force you, but if, anybody, if any of you want to live a better life while in the camp, you can voluntarily go and sleep with Japanese men and we'll give you all these luxuries. Yeah, I thought that aspect of the movie was really interesting um, and one of the themes of the film overall, the kind of survival versus kind of maintaining one's honour and being kind of honourable about these things is, uh, is really hit on in an interestingly kind of fashion in that scene. It, it is interesting. Um, one thing to point out, again, though is that's not how it happened in, in reality um, in, in reality this threat of sexual violence was apparently ongoing and, and women were being constantly I mean I think the Japanese withdrew, withdrew rations at one point to try to force some of the women to do this um, apparently in the early days of the camp there were men also there and a lot of the Australian British men were saying to these women for God's sakes go and sleep with these guys for the sake of all of us you know, it wasn't nearly as nice as it's presented in the film. And when we see these women at the end of the film sort of sitting there drinking cups of tea, it really is presented as if, well, lucky them, they, they got out of it. Um, they are living a life of luxury. Um, yeah, after such a... It wasn't of... like that. They, they, were trading, they were trading sexual favours with the enemy who they despise on a personal level and, and on a professional level as well. I mean, these were nurses. They, they were therefore employed by the army and it was not a good thing to be seen to be sleeping with the enemy, literally. So, yeah, the film really makes it a lot more pleasant than it was. Um, I think the film uses this scene, though, to comment on the issue of survival, as if mm -hmm. how far would you go? And 
and the idea, I suppose, is that these women who joined the Satin Sheep Brigade were sort of of a lower moral standing and they were criticised for taking the easy way out. Although, interestingly, I think the film concedes towards the end, they probably made a really smart decision. Within the context of this film, I think, yes. within the context of the reality of this film, doing that was the easy option. Yes, we don't see them five years later. No, we don't. And they look very, very happy and very well taken care of. Yeah, it just it wasn't like that. And even before I looked up the history, it didn't ring true for me. I mean, did that ring true for anybody, the way that scene was handled? It was just... Let's, let's, oh, there's something insidious <laughs> about it. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about one of the, the kind of key moments or key themes, key happenings of the film, which is the music and the, mm. the vocal orchestra. Uh, and you mentioned to me uh, that one of your kind of favourite scenes, one of the scenes that really got you was that first performance of the orchestra, of the vocal orchestra. Yeah, it's a powerful scene. Um, it's, and Beresford is quite good, I think, at delivering the emotional punches when, when, um, when he can. Even though I wasn't loving this film, I think the sequence where they do do their first um, performance is really powerful. And you've, you know, you've got the, the snake and the Japanese men storming up to stop them and they hear them sing and you know, they sort of stop stunned by the beauty of the music. And I think part of the reason this scene works is the music is beautiful. I mean... You, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for, for sort of good pieces of music, and it can, it can redeem so much and move me so much. So it's it's almost a little bit too easy. But there's, there's an aspect of uh, music soothes the savage beast in there. I think. Yeah, and that's a big theme of the film: the way the music's used as defiance, and the way it is used to sort of inspire hope. Um, it, it, look, it, it is it is a powerful scene, and it, it, it captures the solidarity between the women to sort of not fight amongst themselves and to come together to create something beautiful uh, amid all the horror. And, and that works, and the importance of the music does constantly reverberate through the film. I mean, going back to the whole satin sheep brigade scene, that's the main argument Len Close uses with that woman. You know, don't go and join these girls. We need you because you're a soprano. So the music, even in that scene, becomes the most important thing, um, even though in the real events the choir was formed a lot later after all that stuff. But. <laughs> Mr. Technical. I am. I'm breaking my own rules about not being too obsessed with history, but I think it's this kind of film where you do need to. We're going to dive into a Q&A in about five minutes' time, so if you have questions for Thomas, uh, and we're certainly kind of saying lots of difficult things about this film this afternoon, um, store them in your brain because we'll come back to you in about five minutes' time. Uh, before we get there, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Japanese characters. Yeah, great. Because they're, they're interesting and, uh, I mean... The snake is probably the best. I mean, why, why does he take Glenn Close into the middle of the jungle and sing to her? Yes, well, this, this is a classic example of music soothing the savage beast. This is the moment where, where the snake becomes transformed and then redeemed because he loves music. Anybody who loves music ends up on the good side of things in, in this film. I mean, as opposed to, what's his name, Captain Tanaka, when he first hears the music, he sort of storms around the officer's lodging just looking annoyed. Um, yeah, you sort of got, well, the four main Japanese characters, you've got um, the snake who's sort of, I suppose, depicted as a bit brutal. He's lower, he seems to be lower class, uneducated, kind of loves the brutality, but he does have a huge change of face in this film after hearing the music. And, you know, it starts to... You know, in later scenes, we see him listening to the concert and another soldier comes to speak to him. He ang angrily pushes them off. Um, when the Kate Blanchett character is being tortured, I think he's the one who signals for an officer to stop Drummond from giving her water, not because he doesn't want to give her water, but because he's worried about Tanaka seeing. You know, you see him glance up at the officer's lodge in, in, in a panic. So he goes through a big transformation. Um, as opposed to Tanaka, who is, is... Am I saying that right? Um, yeah, Captain Tanaka. Yeah, as opposed to Tanaka, who is clearly identified as being highly intelligent, and I suppose the idea behind him is he should therefore know better. You know, he's introduced, speaking perfect English, talking about how educated he is. And, he, I mean, he really is the villain of the film. I mean, he is so sadistic, so reveling in what he does. You know, when they're having the funeral for Drummond, he mocks them for that. He's such a bad guy. And the other characters are um, General uh, Hirota. Sorry, Colonel Hirota, who is interesting. He... 
And I think he and the interpreter sort of capture the Japanese people who were involved in this war, who it never just felt it never felt right for them. They were they they weren't nationalists or militaristic like the others. I mean, Hirota always seems a little bit uncomfortable with what he's doing. I think the portrayal of Hirota and the interpreter is really good. I think the film gets some really nice subtleties with these two characters that they were sort of caught up in this conflict, trying to do what they felt was right for their country, and it just didn't feel true to them. Do you think Bruce Beresford was conscious of not kind of uh, propping up kind of anti-Japanese sentiment too much in the film? Yes, uh, look, I, I, I think so. It was the second viewing of the film that made me come around to liking a, a little bit more. I think you do get very different shades of attitudes and behaviour with the four main Japanese characters. And apparently people who did experience the camp said that the film was more or less accurate about the general attitude. Um, which is another thing worth commenting on, that you know, the worst thing that the Japanese did to their prisoners was just not giving a damn about them. They weren't sort of brutalising them with the relish to the extent that you see in this film so much, apparently. It was neglect. I mean, people... What people died from in these camps were not being set alive. Um, it was malnutrition, disease and exhaustion. And the film doesn't really tackle that dynamic until the very end. Um, which I hate to say is kind of boring. I mean, I think that's may maybe why they didn't tackle that throughout the film, because it's not very cinematic to watch people lying around a camp slowly dying off one by one. I think this film is bizarrely anticlimactic that way. And I feel horrible saying that after everything I've said about my problems with, with the way this film changes its history to be more cinematic. I do concede that it would have been really dull if they stuck too much to the truth. <laughs> What, what did you make of that, that, that kind of closing comment from the, the Japanese um, when he says, uh, the war is over, we're now friends? What, what, what has that got to say about the Australian-Japanese relationship? That comment right there. Yeah, it's a good question. That, I think that's quite a nasty little indictment against the Japanese, that scene. It's sort of... There's a bit of suspicion implied in that isn't there. That we know as the audience that he doesn't believe this. He's sort of trying to radically backpedal and to say, yep, war's over, we're all friends. I'm going to ignore everything that's been done to you. I've treated you as well as I could. Yeah, yeah. I think that the, that's a bit troubling. I think the suggestion in that scene is, you know, we, we, can't, we can't trust the Japanese for when they say that they're our friends because we've just seen what they're capable of. All right. Well, that sounds harsh. I don't mean it that badly. <laughs> let's, uh, let's open up to the audience. If anyone has a question for Thomas about Paradise Road, just put your hand up and we'll bring microphones to you. While you're, um, while you're percolating, perhaps, I might ask you, Thomas, about uh, the self-determination that's kind of idealised in the film. Mm. Uh, and this kind of comes about maybe in the second half of the film, after we've been there for a little while, and we start to get kind of notions on a character-by-character -character basis of the nun who really wants to be the mechanic and, you mm. know, the Kate Blanchett who really, you know, didn't realise that she wants to be a doctor, but maybe she does. And kind of everyone, and, you know, Glenn Close's character obviously wants to, you know, conduct the choir. Everyone mm. kind of has a personal goal. What, what does the, uh, what's the director saying there about kind of, you know, the way that war makes us think and think about our future? Yeah, well, I think it's, it is an interesting dynamic. When, when you go through hell, you do realise what's important in life. And, and, you know, the conflict in this film, it strips away so much, you know, of these people's identity and, and comforts, sort of, in a way, helps them to realise what life is all, all about. You know, when you lose everything, you start to finally see what's important. So you get that with those characters. Uh, even Mrs Roberts, you know, the, the, sort of the, the very large woman who's just so insanely over-the-top pompous and stuffy and, you know, she has that scene as she's dying where she just says, I did nothing in Shanghai. That's actually quite a nice moment. Her best scene is when she dies, actually, because <laughs> cause she's really annoying. But, um, <laughs> but also because, um, yeah, it's quite moving, her realisation that this sort of life of luxury and just being a wife amounted to nothing and she wasted her time and the implication is though at the camp she finally got to be somebody because she was part of a greater good which, which was again you know that's the vocal orchestra um yeah i think that's a nice sentiment that comes through in this film that through the trial that these characters go through some of them have something good to come out of it with yeah all right questions 
Yes, I just wanted to ask a question um, about the representation of the Japanese in this film, in a maybe a, a broader context, um, in, say, in relation to things like Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, or Thin Red Line, Empire of the Sun, those sorts of films, and how you, you saw it, the, you know, the Japanese portrayed in a kind of comparative sense? Yeah, well, I mean, great question, because all those films you've just mentioned, I think, do it in a far better, more sophisticated way. Um, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which is based on a novel. Um, oh, I think the novel was written by a prisoner of war. I can't quite remember. But, um, yeah, fascinating film, which really grapples with the English prisoners trying to understand the Japanese mentality. And, and there is, I mean, what's beautiful about that film is it doesn't excuse any of the abuses or violations of rights, but it helps to try to present an understanding that we had two very different world views colliding, and there is a bizarre respect that develops. And you get that in Empire of the Sun as well, in, in, in the novel and the film. It's sort of more of a respect and an understanding about what the Japanese mentality was. And it wasn't evil, it was a different way of looking at the world. Um, and the thing red lines got, you know, the, the first time you see the Japanese is in a major... Uh, conflict and that sequence is so beautifully filmed because I think you get the ratio of Japanese and Americans pretty much accurate, pretty much um, you know it, it's matched 50-50, and, and and that sequence is just to tell you that war is hell and people on both sides are terrified and angry and appalled and violent and in despair and so I think that equilibrium is really really important. Do you think that war is hell sentiment and to a further extent the anti-war sentiment comes over in Paradise Road? Is it an anti-war film? Yeah I don't know I I think anti-war films tend to be really a bit more overt with depicting the absurd the absurdity of war and the hypocrisy of both sides I mean I don't think this film is ever suggesting that the struggle was futile or, you know, being run by politicians or, you know, in today's context, being run by multinational corporations. I don't think this film is actually all that critical of war. And, and the Second World War and the First World War tend to still be quite romanticised, especially in the Australian mentality. Yeah. 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 So mm, it's anti-war in the sense that it shows you war is bad, yes. but I don't think it's a film making a really aggressive statement against the necessity of war. I guess it's making more interesting kind of observations about what characters can do despite war. Yeah, and look, and it is sort of part of that Australian tradition of, you know, this idea that war defined this country which I find so disturbing. So much of our, ident our identity is based on how much blood we spilled on for foreign soils while, while fighting for other countries. But that's a big part of the Australia. I mean, that's what Anzac's all about. But, you know, you know th 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 that going and killing people and being killed by other people is what helped define us as an independent nation. I mean, that is so ingrained in Australian culture. So it's interesting getting, I suppose, the female perspective of that from this film. And you do get that kind of Anzac spirit in this film, that the women sort of come together and, 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 and defy the horrors of war by creating something beautiful. More questions for Thomas on Paradise Road. I might ask you one, unless we have another one, uh, about uh, writing, uh, because we're kind of all very used to writing about books and about texts in essays, but when it comes to writing and kind of analysing film um, through the kind of lens of Paradise Road, how you, if you would have advice for people who need to be doing that very soon? Yeah, well, look, the very, very general advice about writing on film is it's not just about the story and the dialogue. You know, you can't just talk about what happens and what people say. Make sure you talk about film style, the look of the film. Think about how the camera gives close-ups to some characters and not others. You know, what's shown in the distance, what is intimate. Think about what's included and what's excluded. How does editing work? How, how, how do shots being placed next to each other create sympathies or or associate one scene from the next. This film uses a device, uh, it's a pretty common editing device called a sound bridge really nicely. So that's where the sound or, or music from one scene will bleed into another scene. Um, or in this film, it would happen first. So the whole Kate Blanchett sequence, for example, after she's being, um, you know, she's been told she can go free and her, her ordeal is over and, and they're, 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 you know, they're untying her and giving her water. The, the vocal orchestra music from the next scene actually starts in that sequence to sort of, you know, it's part of that, that theme of the music being defiance and hope. So it starts early over Kate Blanchett sort of saying, 
oh, she makes some wise crack or whatever, and then you hear the music and then you get that next scene. So you get a lot of interesting sound bridges to sort of join those scenes together thematically. Yeah. All right. More questions for Thomas on Paradise Road. I, um, I have a, one down the front here. Was there? Yeah. Thank you. Would you like to say a little bit more about the gender difference maybe in the way in which it's depicting, you know, women and their relationship with war and survival? Is there anything in it really that is deliberately defining men and women's response to war and survival? Anything more specific than what you've already said? Yeah. No, is there a deliberate intention for that? I think there is. I, I, and, and what... Yeah, there's a sense of pragmatism and community in this film that I think is actually quite different from perhaps a lot of male war films. Um, male war films, you know, you do tend to get a bunch of individual guys to sort of work together and you get that mateship idea, but it's a different dynamic to this. There is a real sense of problem solving and and, and, and working through the different, the different issues and... Um, yeah, I suppose there's no posturing, that there's no grandstanding in this film. You don't get any sort of that kind of very masculine chest thumping. And it, it, it's, it's working towards a common group. And it's a real sense of, oh, I don't want to say nurturing, that sounds horribly cliched, but sort of, yeah, l looking after each other. I think community is really big in this film. This is a film about a social... It, it, it's about social cohesion, yeah. I suppose, and all the different elements working together for the greater good, as opposed to a single hero. I mean, there's no protagonist in this film. There's lots of protagonists, um, and, and the, that's quite interesting. Yeah, and the vocal choir, I guess, is symbolic for that, the way it kind of yep. absorbs more and more of the uh, kind of, yeah, the people in the, in the camp. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, the, the, that question kind of reminds me of the fact that, and this is barely touched on in the film, um, but there are children in the camp as well, and I mean, we very rarely see them, but they're there, and I, I guess that's like another, you don't often see kind of POWs uh, with, with children in the camp, and, oh, well, and, and why the that's sun. not touched on. Yeah, Empire of the Sun deals with that. Yeah. Magnificently. Yeah. That is odd. I, I keep forgetting that there's children in this film. I, I keep thinking the Pamela Rabe character is so grumpy all the time because her kids have been shot or lost. And, and No, they're still there, apparently. I just... Um in fact, what maybe one of the annoying aspects of this film is that the only kind of like real kind of character development that the children get is when the boys are heading towards puberty and look at a, a leg, and that's maybe a little that's right. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a bit of an annoying detail, isn't it? It's sort of I think the children are reluctantly included in this film as a detail, but there's certainly no exploration of what it was like to be a child in the camp or what it was like for the adults to have children around. Um, well, they, they, they do mention at times, you know. There's a whole scene about um, you should kill the dog because it eats, you know, enough food for one of the children. Yeah. So there we go. Children are often used to excuse killing dogs. That's what you can take from this. Uh, it can often be kind of helpful to students to incorporate or analyse the, the title of a film and why a particular title is chosen and how mm. that kind of plays out through the film and what it means. In the terms of, in, of Paradise Road, what would you say about that? Well, I mean, literally, it, it, it's a line spoken during the funeral of of, um, of Wing. Wing. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's what it's 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 from a hymn or it's from a reading. I mean, Paradise Road. It, it implies a journey. I mean, most of this film is sedentary. They're in the one spot. So I guess it, it's 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 sort of implying that for most of the film, maybe they're stuck in one place, but they're going on a sort of spiritual journey to sort of find themselves and to find a better place and that's sort of yeah this kind of working together this social cohesion t to create something beautiful and to you know create a sense of community and and that that is a journey and it's you know that is the road to paradise that you may be physically stuck in hell but you can aspire to something more beautiful and it's also kind of very scenic in hell as well. I mean, you could make arguments that kind of they're, you know, the, where they are is kind of paradise in hell in paradise. <laughs> yeah, well, sort of. I mean, I guess the camp is sort of like a big, ugly, concrete road through, you know, it's just just smack bang in the middle of this beautiful jungle. Yeah, some um, of those establishing shots are just gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful location, yeah. but... um. You know, and, and that, 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 that's one of the many cruelties of what happens to these people. They're, they're stuck in this horrible camp surrounded by beauty, you know, this, this paradise.
Yeah. All right. <laughs> we might wind things up there. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult film, but it, uh, it's an important one when it comes to kind of Australian history and, and the role that we played in World War II. Um, please, everyone, thank Thomas for his thoughts this afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Cheers.